What's happening everybody? Trey here joined by my dad Sean and today at Reaction to the Classics it is time to review the debut record of one of the great American bands of all time, R.E.M. And I want to shout out the biggest R.E.M. fan I know, longtime friend of uh, the channel man and longtime patron and supporter of RTTC. Love having our dude Brian, you, aka Brian. AYBL Main, which uh, he also makes some videos, man. We'll link his channel yep, down below. Definitely go check it out. A lot of REM stuff. So if you want oh, some yeah. REM, go watch the vid that I link below. This was just a, such a fun exercise, Dad. Uh, and I know you're about to get into kind of the history of REM itself. Also, just this record, which is uh, one of the best, I think, debut records of all time. Yeah, the most important part of this review is really the upfront stuff mm -hmm. in the first song. As far as understanding where REM is coming from, you know anything about REM? Form in 1980 of course michael stipe on vocals bill berry on guitars mike mills on bass and peter buck mm -hmm. on that guitar they were really well thought of built up a following in the college radio and just traveling around to smaller clubs and venues sold over 85 million records Ooh. as you said this is their debut album with irs records they had a little bit of independent stuff that they put out before that charted in the 30s in the u.s but highly acclaimed so highly acclaimed and very controversial at the time, which probably kind of helped R.E.M. In 1983, Rolling Stone magazine picked this as the 1983 album of the year over Michael Jackson's Thriller, The Police's Synchronicity, and U2's War, mm. among many Loaded others. Loaded year. <laughs> Loaded year. However, IRS Records actually wasn't happy with the sales of this. It sold about 200,000 copies early on, uh, so they, they were not too thrilled with that. I do got to shout out Brian because he brought us an R.E.M. Top 10. That's right. And before that, I couldn't stand R.E.M. growing up in this time. You know, I was, I was 12 years old at the time this came out, and even as their other stuff, I was in my teens. It really wasn't a thing for a teenager. Mm -hmm. I went back and listened to this album probably, I don't know, probably a year ago, and I just fell in love. It's actually my favorite R.E.M. No, man. And album. I, I was a little familiar with it, not as familiar as you, but uh, even from fir first listen, you know, a year or whatever ago, I was like, yeah, R.E.M., uh, they got some talent, man. They got some crazy talent. So the way this thing comes about, they start recording in December of 82, but what happens when you sign with the record company is they tell you who you're going to do stuff with. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be produced by a guy, a guy named Stephen Haig. So they go in and they drop one song. They drop Catapult, but he kept making them record it over and over again. And it demoralized drummer Bill Berry. And then mm -hmm. he took it to another studio when they were done. And he put keyboards in it. And they were they were they just could not believe it. <laughs> so they petitioned IRS to be able to use a guy named Mitch Easter, who they recorded with before. So they go and record with Easter and Don Dixon. They record the song Pilgrimage. They send it back to IRS. They're like, yes, you can go with that. So that kind of brings us to how this album comes about. And just one other quick thing of why they sound like they do really throughout mm -hmm. most of their careers. They recorded the album via a process of what's called negation, refusing to incorporate rock music cliches such as guitar solos or then popular synths to give this music a timeless feel. Barry specifically was resistant to quote odd musical suggestions, insisting that his drums be recorded in a drummer's booth, a practice that was antiquated at the time. And then Dixon and Easter took a hands-off approach to much of the recording. They would only fix a vocal track or ask Stipe to re-record a vocal if it was very substandard. While the sound on this was new at the time, it was not stepping beyond too much traditional rock music. The guitars had that bright ring-like chime that brought on comparisons to the birds, and that bass guitar had the bright, punchy sound of the Rickenbacker favored by Mike Mills. Mills carried much of the melodic element of the music on the bass, contributing to the sound and almost moodiness of these early mm -hmm. R.E.M. records, really the five IRS records that they start out with. This is the first one. So that that way you kind of know where they're coming from. Yeah. That's why you don't have the guitar solos and all these other things. This is why. So let's jump into this. Thing. Well, we're going to jump into the uh, biggest song off this yes. Radio Free Europe. And it's funny that you mentioned that, Dad, because the I think the driving bass by Mills here complements that jangly uh, guitar tone and sound from sure. uh, from Buck quite well. And, uh, you know, Buck's work throughout this whole record is just... Uh, it's fantastic. It's pivotal, man. I, I love the jangly rock uh, type of sound, man. That's why I think I like the Smiths so much. And uh, yeah. same holds true here for REM. And then whenever uh, Stipe's voice comes in, uh, it's uh, in the chorus, almost like he's making an announcement. Radio Free Europe. And uh, even though you can't really understand a lot of the other lyrics, it doesn't yeah. matter, man, because the instrumentation is just so stellar. So back in their independent days, they signed with a, well, sort of signed with a record yeah. called Hib Tone. And this was their debut single in 1981. They re-recorded it for the album. This is a new version here. They actually liked the 1981 mm -hmm. one more. But yes, you can't understand the lyrics. The lyrics have never been published officially. They've been published in a couple of magazines. But Stipe said, I didn't want you 
to really mm-hmm. understand the lyrics. It really wasn't about that. Um, and he said, I like to change them in concert. I just kind of do whatever. Vocals are almost like an instrument sometimes. Yeah. It's just lending into the melody and seamlessly going in there. And you know me, Trey, if you watch this channel all the time, I'm a lyrics guy. Yeah. But I, this album is proof that I can love something that is, has <laughs> yeah. nothing to do with lyrics because none of these songs are any sort of deep lyrical thing. But just a fantastic sound. If you don't like this song, I'm going to tell you you can stop listening to it because you're going <laughs> to like the rest of the album. But a great kickoff. Oh, definitely, man. And then that takes us into Pilgrimage where you can kind of see unbelievable talent of Barry on yes. the drums here. You even got a vibraphone from Mills here on top of his usually stellar bass work. You have talk of speaking in tongues, your hate, and noting this will not last. Kind of makes me think this person is possibly taking their uh, turn for fortune on a place or people who don't uh, want him there. Yeah, I don't know a lot more to add to it. I think it draws you in from the very start because Michael's vocals are mixed way far back. So yeah. you're kind of like, what is this dude saying? And, and it's going to be a broken record on here, but the uh, the guitars are mm-hmm. fantastic. You can understand Michael much more than you can yeah. Radio Free Europe. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because just like Radio Free Europe, I think the song really peaks with that chorus, as a lot of these uh, tunes do. Yeah, I agree. And that's going to take us to laughing. Different here is the bass opens it. Mm-hmm. Michael's much more hard to understand on here. Great soundscape, a lighter feel to this song, and that jangly guitar is mm-hmm. really what's uh, what gives you that just kind of I don't know if I want to say happy feeling, but no. much more upbeat feeling. No, definitely uplifting. This uh, is actually my favorite track on the record by, wow. a, by a wide margin, actually. Wow, so, really? Uh, from first listen, man, I, okay. I've been drawn to this one. And, uh, uh, you know, revisiting this record for the review, I was like, yeah, man, this still is at the top for me. The melody provided by Buck's guitar, so catchy and brilliant with Stipe's uh, soft vocal performance. Lyrically, we might be kind of, th- we touch on some of the, like, Greek-Roman myths about, yeah. you know, maybe a person moving on from a relationship i don't know i just know that this sounds so pretty to my ears and uh, i keep revisiting no, it. <laughs> I, I respect it 100 percent, man that's going to take us to talk about the passion which the most interesting thing about this song is it was the second single released mm-hmm. and i'm like why it's not a bad song but i'm like man alive i got a lot of them that i like better than this it didn't chart that doesn't surprise no, yeah, me that... like i said it's a fine song michael said this song is about hunger but he didn't make the lyrics direct mm. enough, and he had regret about that. The only direct reference in that being Empty Mouth. Great guitar intro. For me, it's good, but it's my least fave so far. No, it, I was also surprised that this was chosen yeah. as a single, man. Just, uh, you know, again, not that it's a bad track, but you just feel others were maybe a little bit more exactly. worthy. Uh, again, that full band sound coming in, the jangly guitar tone. Uh, some pretty, uh, I think, uh, heavy religious themes as well, mm-hmm. or at least that's how I interpreted the line, like, uh, not everybody can, you know, carry the weight of the whole world yes. or, or something along those lines. Which goes with kind of the hunger and taking mm-hmm. care of people. So, yeah, I agree with you. So, you know, that's kind of what it couple that with you know having the word passion in there you, know, you conjure up images of, of jesus uh, at least i did so uh yeah. um you know still a, a, a solid tune and uh we're gonna go down to track five yeah we got moral kiosk which mm. is one of my favorite tracks on here you have a driving guitar and drumming great chorus echo on michael sound effects kind of sound like hand claps the thing about this one more than is a very complex arrangement it's mm-hmm. the most complex arrangement we've had so far and that's saying some considering the way they're their soundscape all oh, meshes yeah. together. Yeah, and there's a point on this song, Dad, where Stipe's almost like in a, a tribal chant mm-hmm. delivering the lyric inside, cold, dark, fire, twilight, showcasing the opposites there. A, a bit more of a rocker. I think that Barry on the kit is the MVP of this song. I and, agree. you know, you just kind of think like a kiosk, I can go there for convenience, pick yep. up something. Can you buy your morals from a kiosk here? It seems, a, you know, a lot of people in our modern day world might be trying to do so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, just yet again, look, one of those interesting and uh, there's almost a sense of mystery in a lot of these REM tunes that uh, they just leave it to the listener to kind of put what the, they want to behind the meaning. And I always like when a band does that. I do too. We're going to finish out the A side with Perfect Circle. Like a lot of the songs in here is a sound typified by unusual instruments and recording techniques. It opens with the honky tonk piano, more associated with ragtime and early country. Two pianos were recorded in the slightly out of sync sound and reverb achieve a detached otherworldly effect features peter buck's 12 string guitar lyrics as always are 
purposely opaque. The guys have different meanings for it and what they what they think about it. Vocals are excellent, Trey. Mm -hmm. You feel the emotion. I'm gonna say this about this particular song. It's one of my top 20 favorite songs of all time. Really, man? That's how much I love I, I just, this song, I don't know. It's just one of those things, kind of what you're talking about mm -hmm. with laughing. Like, the first time I heard this, I'm like, oh my goodness. Well, and that's an interesting point about, because, uh, about Stipe's vocals, because this song is more stripped back. We have yes. Mills jumping on piano here, and I think it aids uh, Stipe's more drawn-out delivery. And you could argue, mm -hmm. um, I'd argue, that the chorus here is probably the, the peak moment on this record just as a whole. I agree. Um, it, it's just so emotionally stern, gets you thinking about, uh, you know, life and, and, you know, kind of some of these, uh, you know, relational questions and uh, just a, a brilliant, brilliant track to just kind of throw in the middle here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I was like, wow, what are you guys doing? But it finishes off the side. So now we go to side two. Start out with Catapult. I love the build, Trey, to the driving chorus and Stipe's unique pronunciation of catapult. <laughs> That's right. The response by others is clever and the jangly guitar is great. So this mm -hmm. is also, I don't know if it's going to be in my favorite tracks, but it is a standout for me, especially on this second side. No, I just, uh, when you mention that, I hear Stipe, catapult. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 catapult. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I do really enjoy the way he uh, delivers that line. Uh, uh, when I listen to this track, you kind of uh, get a sense of nostalgia. Yes. You have the lyrics. When we were little boys and girls, it's nine o'clock. Don't try to turn it off you know makes you think where well, we just catapulted into the the world you know as as youngsters whenever we uh we weren't uh, particularly ready or, or whatnot and yeah it, it shows too that uh you you can make a catchy course with just one word uh as well yeah for sure man for sure well, like i said one of my standouts on the second side now we're going to go to sitting still this is an interesting song because when hip tone signed them and they did mm -hmm. radio free europe they did this song and they did shaking through hip tone founder johnny Hibbert agreed to release this song on with Radio Free Europe, mm -hmm. you know, A B side. But when he did that, Trey, he took ownership of these songs. Ah, so they that's bought right. them back before this album came out. But they re recorded mm -hmm. Radio Free Europe. But this is actually the 1981 recording. They, they fixed a few things. Mills went back and fixed some, and they fixed some of the backing vocals. But this is, uh, this is what they recorded back. Back in the well, day. it's interesting that they were able to buy it back too. Did the they not think that uh, REM was going to do anything? Yeah, because or? they didn't do a lot on the hip tone. <laughs> you know, because it's hard to get over at that time. They didn't have a mainstream. They had a different kind of sound than what was going mm -hmm. on with the new wave stuff. Yeah, and they were ready. So yeah, I imagine he just signed it away and went. That's fine. He uh, yeah, well, sold it for a small <laughs> sum and then went, uh-oh, what just happened here? No, man, that is cool that they were able to at least yeah. get that ownership back as so often, obviously, in the music industry. That's a uh, tough feat for artists to do. This is a bottom-tier track for me. Yeah, me too. Um, which I think uh, highlights how strong this record it does. is. This it's, is more melancholy, mm -hmm. you know, and atmospheric and just kind of a... But yeah, it does highlight how just absolutely solid this album yeah. is. I will say one thing about the meaning. Types acknowledge much of the song is nonsensical vowels strung together, and he merely approximates the words when he sings it in concert. To the extent it contains decipherable lyrics, some seem to think it's inspired at least by Stipe's sister, who is deaf and teaches deaf children, so maybe with the sitting still. Now we're gonna go to 9-9. Nine, nine. It's my least favorite up to this point. Really? Uh -oh. It's one of my favorite tracks on here, actually. And that, actually. once again, shows you <laughs> how good this album is. So Trey, I, I mean, I don't hate it. I like no, it. I mean, yeah. this album's very, very high on a score for me, so there's no song on here I don't like, but... Why don't you take this? Well, I, I think this might be Stipe's best vocal performance, especially in the chorus. He's got a, uh, a great vocal melody and one high note in particular. Right. Um, you know, you could definitely argue uh, for some other tunes on here. But uh, yet again, I think that Buck is on fire during the track. It feels like it's a bit more of a grower than other songs yeah, on I, here, I think, maybe. I think side two is a little bit more mm. of a grower for the most part than side one. Yeah, I but uh, But I think it's worth the time to maybe, you know, if you've only heard the record once, or twice to maybe spin this one a couple times on its own um yeah. at least for me man it, it stands out but uh, uh that is interesting how you know we differ yeah, like, on wow that, man. okay yeah. all right so now we're gonna go to the 10th track there's 12 on here shaking through which is one of those three songs that were on on head tone i really like the atmosphere on this mm -hmm. one once again not not a standout for me yeah. or anything like perfect circle this track features a prominent piano and that upbeat alt rock atmosphere that made rem famous stipes vocal uh, almost shakes through in a sense you like you like the uh the connections yeah, i'm say, doing yeah, there i like what you did there but uh then we only got two songs left yeah we go to we walk it only has one true verse up the stairs to the landing up the stairs into the hall take oasis marat's bathing 
Meaning is Jean-Paul Marat was a left-wing philosopher during the French Revolution. He became housebound because of his skin condition and took many baths because of this. He was stabbed by a sympathizer from the other side while taking one of these baths. His death became a symbol of academic conflict and uprising during the revolution. But even though he's not writing a lot of <laughs> high-level stuff, he chooses this to write a song oh, that yeah. has one verse with this just high-level uh, meaning to it. It's okay for me. Again, mm -hmm. Jangly Guitar is definitely the highway. And it's still a good song, you know. I think I'm kind of underselling side two because there's mm -hmm. so many songs I like on side one, yeah. but still a good song. No, yeah, towards the bottom for me as well, but it's interesting with that subject matter because it's almost a structured as a children's-like song with it the quasi-like sing-along nature that uh, Stipe's delivering on the, the vocals here, but uh, I don't have too much more to add as we go to our closer. West of the Field. In a rare instance of REM co-writing, Stipe asked friend Neil Bogan to contribute lyrics to this song. Otherwise, they get writing credit and mm -hmm. all the others. I didn't mention that up front. And so, Trey, this is my least favorite song mm -hmm. on the album. So it pains me that they ended the album this way. It's not a bad song, but man, they could have flipped a few things around. But hey, man. No, yeah, I, I again agree with you that it's maybe towards the bottom of this record. I did enjoy when the whole band came in with a harmony on yeah. Long Gone. And, I, I thought that was the highlight of it. And yet again, it shows how strong uh, the, the choruses are just on this entire uh, record. You know, that, that theme holds true for, uh, for this song as well, man. And uh, that'll take us now to our favorite tracks. I'll let you kick this e one easy off. Easy for me, Radio Free Europe, yep. Moral Kiosk, and of course, Perfect circle. There's about three, four others I yeah. could put in there, but I'll hold the three on that. I, yours, I know I'm going to Yeah, be. I'll go uh, uh, Laughing. Yep. I'll go Radio for Europe, Perfect Circle, and 9 uh, 9. 9 dash 9. nine I, don't, I, don't yeah, know. I don't know how you say it. That's why I said 9 9 when we we're going over it. I don't know. So. <laughs> Now we get to the overall score, Trey. I'm going to let you go first. Well, man, this is, as I mentioned, just uh, one of the, the better, I think, debut records uh, by you know any any rock band like ever, great. man. It, every single song has some type of quality to it that uh, at least makes me want to return, even those that are towards that bottom yeah, tier. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you got some absolute classic singles on here and some uh, gems that maybe uh, get uh, a overlooked when talking about R.E.M. in general, that alt-rock sound, the James guitars man it all works together well uh, a great four-piece group here and I'm going to nine out of ten I'm going real high on this yeah you are and I'll tell you guys you know one of the advantages of course to a debut album from a band that's been around for a while is man you kind of get just the best of the best because mm -hmm. they've been they've been doing these for a while now and I think that's what you get here I was absolutely blown away by this album the first oh, yeah. time I listened to it I listened to it 15 times in a row this is like a year ago <laughs> when I revisit it now and I still revisit this album on occasion still mm -hmm. and we don't listen to much stuff on our own because you don't got a lot of time so for me it's going to be a 9.25 I think it's one absolutely one of the 10 best debuts of all time yeah dude you it's know, killer come at me I, I get it <laughs> but yeah I loved it thank you Brian not only for bringing oh, us yeah. this album but also Give me to change my view on <laughs> REM because that, that is a huge deal for me because I've, I've grown to really love these guys. No, and of course, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Murmur down in the comment section below. Would you rank it amongst the, the best uh, debut records of all time? Be sure to let us know as well as give props to our guy Brian, aka AYBL Main. And as I mentioned at the start, be sure to give his channel yep, a look. Got a link right below. And uh, if you enjoyed this video, y'all, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Hit that big red subscribe button. We upload every single day. And if you'd like to subscribe, support the channel in any way you can check out our patreon page we uh, much appreciate all of you who support rttc man Definitely. and uh we're gonna we're gonna keep on chugging along we here are, man. man but uh until next time as always dad appreciate yeah, all the research a lot of fun man we're waiting a long time to do this one happy listening my friends and we will see you